Ever since high school, I was interested in CNC machining. So I decided one day I would buy myself a CNC machine, but I'd never seen one before. I only knew what it could do. So at first I was like, I'm going to build one, but then I realized that was too complicated. So I eventually converted a Sherline mill to a CNC. And then later when 3D print, you know, when the RepRap first started coming out, I wasn't impressed. It was awful. The prints were ugly. I couldn't see any use for it. So I stuck with my CNC machine. But then when the uh, rep reps started getting really good and MakerBot was still uh, doing cool stuff, they had the Thingomatic, and that one was just putting out awesome prints. So I sold my CNC machine and I immediately got, you know, I put in an order for the Thingomatic. And so I was having a lot of fun with that. And then the Prusas started getting better than my Thingomatic, so now I wanted one of those. <laughs> I'd like to think that we can make better stuff than we can buy and we can make what we want where it's a lot harder to define what we it seems like it's harder to define up front what we want because it changes as we make it um, I don't know there's just so much to learn the opportunity to learn through making it just works better for me anyway. I know there's a lot of people that can learn in the classroom, but I I like to take stuff apart and put stuff together and actually feel the benefit of making it. I think there there's a lot of apprehension in getting into rep wraps and, um, and trying out 3D printers and doing it. And I think that if I had to convey one message, I would say, you know, you, you shouldn't be uh, afraid of it or frightened of it. I think, um, it's open and friendly. There are a lot of people using it, and um, you can really do some amazing things uh, given the patience and, and uh, uh, well, time. It's not more dangerous than a glue gun because the 3D printer is like, so the glue is like the filament, uh -huh. and um, inside the glue gun, it, it heats up the glue and then squirts it out. That's like the 3D printer. Yeah, that's exactly and what the printer does, yeah. And it, well, like, if you can use a glue gun, you're going to be able to do this. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I made friends with the Nashville Hackerspace and they told me that uh, Sonny, a guy named Sonny, was going to run a build-off. So I got in contact with him and I paid the 950 bucks for the the seat in the build off so now I've got my Prusa. I really run the build events based on word of mouth and right now it's when people when there are eight to ten people interested we you know we get together a build event and we start doing it. I don't have a company, it's not a business, there's no advertising, there's not even much of a website. And it was so much fun to build that I'm like, well now I just want to make my own so that's what I'm doing now. Why I dive into rep rap it's really simple. Everyone expects that I will say something really profound, like, oh, I wanted to change the future. No, it's not like that. I just found it on Hackaday or something. It's fun, I, know, I now know Hackaday guys, it's really cool. Uh, but it was just a cool project to, to, to start with. And I didn't have any uh, ambitions to change the project. I just liked it and I played with it I learned everything basically from rap rap and from the information shared online I don't have any formal education of engineering or anything like that and well it happened that I made the design which was widely used it's that simple I like the rep rap route because it's very open and it keeps you engaged um, I think the Prusa models are the a very good entry point um, and, and so if you look at the just spectrum of machines, you've got the Mendel Maxes, you've got the, you know, rep wraps, uh, like the Prusas, you've got the Rostocks, you've got, um, I've got a Tantalus over there that you've obviously got video of. And um, a lot of those are more, 
are either specialized or more difficult to work with. So for instance, the Tantalus produces great prints, but it's got some fringe technologies that not a lot of people use. Um, whereas if you look at the base Prusa, like an I3 or an I2 Prusa, it's very general and it's good for most things. It doesn't have a gigantic build platform. Um, it doesn't, you know, it, um, it's not ultra portable, but it's, it's, it's a good mix of all the elements. And I usually recommend that people start in the, in the, with a kind of a base model like that and then spread out. Because a lot of times you'll find, or I should say branch out, a lot of times you'll find that people get them and either don't know what to do with them, don't like them, they sit in a closet, they don't do anything. I've got a friend who has a cupcake that I think he's made four prints on and otherwise it's sat in the closet. And that's just because it's been not that interesting to do. Um, but if you get your first Prusa and uh, Prusa Mendel and you start printing with it and you really like it and you find that you want a bigger build area or you want to print plates or whatever the case may be, then you can branch into some of the other models that are a little bit more extreme and specialized than what they do. We'd like to see uh, these 3D printers, this technology, remarkable expand. technology. Yeah. We and, want it to expand. And, and, and we want to get it into schools. Um, not just high schools, not just middle schools, but elementary schools, elementary schools too. Because we think this is a, an absolutely remarkable technology for project-based learning. Um, the kids, uh, when, they, when they get a hold of one, when they look at one of these printers, they understand it. They, they look at it, they see lots of rods and nuts and washers and, and things that they can manipulate and hold. And they've seen these things before. They've seen them at hardware stores and they've seen them um, around the house maybe, and they can see how it all works. So before RepRap, it's like children, I feel like, are, see the world as a mystery that they can't change, and it's all established. And the hope is that now that they realize that they can engineer and design and create things with small amounts of work, they, uh, they realize that they can change the world. I've got a, a almost two-year-old and, and an almost four-year-old right now and they have gotten exposed to my printers at a young age. So they'll come to me and they'll say, Daddy, you know, can you print a Lego to train adapter so that I can you know, build, raise my Thomas to train set up? And one of, my older son is actually building a Skyway. Um, you know, my younger one loves squirrels and I've printed them, I don't know, probably a dozen squirrels. And, and so just in general, their thought process is so different. You know, it's not, let's go to the store to get a toy. It's, Daddy, can you print me a toy? Or, you know, if you look at the Lego and train adapters, it's, can you make me something that I can't buy? Because you can't buy those anywhere. And so when that's ingrained at such a young age, at, you know, three or four years old, or even two years old, like my younger one, they don't even think about they don't even give it a thought. You know, it's just um, it's just a capability you have and you take for granted. And to them, it's well, why doesn't everybody have 3D printers in their house? Why can't everybody do this, Daddy? And and that is um, their science projects will be so crazy that it's uh, not even funny. And I I look forward to really raising them in a world where making is so um, uh, a lot e making is a lot easier than it used to be. What are your plans? I want to, well, I want to make, like, a humongous version, and then I can program it to put houses and stuff. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, like a humongous, humongous version. And print a house? Yeah. Oh, that'd be neat. So the blades were purchased, but everything else was printed, right? Uh, <clears throat> other than the motors and electronics, obviously, yeah. The, all the plastic parts on here, except the blades, the uh, props, uh, were uh, printed. Once you have a 3D printer, anything you want. I even, like, I bought myself a a new shaving kit, you know, and I didn't have a place to mount it, so I went to Walmart and saw some, shucks, some uh, suction cups, and I was like, that's perfect. So now I've got my uh, shaving brush and razor hanging perfectly on my mirror, you know? I mean, it's almost to the point of abuse when you have this much power. <laughs> how, how big is the community? I mean, there's at least 100,000 people, I estimate, easy. I mean, it's, that's just people in the open, that are realize it is open source. 3D printing that they're in. And then beyond that, the derivatives and people that are forked from RepRap, hundreds of thousands.
all of us are the key players. It doesn't matter if it's me or if it's Max Boss or if it's Alessandro or if it's Clement. All of us play a different role and it doesn't matter if we are core developers or not. I mean, when I came to RepRap, I was no one and I still was able to change whole thing all around. So everyone is as important as everybody else. So find something that, that needs improved and, and find the simplest way to, to approach that and start make that improvement. I mean, like right now, there's a lot of things that are that are in real early development stages. Support material, dual extrusion. There's few, not a lot of printers with dual extrusion at this point, but it can be debugged, and it's fairly low hanging fruit. All the the other prerequisites are already built up, and I don't know. Find something, find something that you can do that it, that you have interest in, and just start hacking at it. The one project I've wanted to do for a long time is make a sort of open source file sharing site that's not tied to any 3D printer manufacturer. So all the 3D printer manufacturers need a place where people can get designs, where companies can put designs and things. But the problem is, is that it starts getting complicated when you know one company owns a site that hosts all the files and another company doesn't want to put their files there because then they're promoting the other company's printer. So. What I'm hoping to do and what, I'm, what will be done is that we'll have a, a non-profit foundation that manages a website and a database pretty much for the sharing files that's manufacturer independent, license independent, that's just for the community and people all, all over the world to exchange information and exchange data in a friendly manner. RepRap is a community of hackers, engineers, and makers working on reliable, high-resolution 3D printers. But open source hardware in this open source community doesn't stop at 3D printers. It keeps going. At the moment, we have no way of printing electronics. And until we do, the community needs a way to manufacture circuit boards. This requires small components to be placed on boards for solder. Traditionally, this has been done with what are called pick-and-place machines. Jeff from BoardForge is working on open sourcing pick-and-place. What you see now is just a prototype, but it has lots of potential. If open source hardware, software, or 3D printing interests you, the best way to get started is to find a build event in your area. Build events are great ways to get started because you're able to assemble a 3D printer in a short period of time with support from the pros. You also have the support of builders who can lend a hand if you get stuck. You're not, so it's not short. All right. Yeah, I mean, it, it took me a while to find what I wanted, and then when I saw this and saw the build event, I was like, oh man, this is so worth it. <laughs> if you're having trouble finding a build event, another great resource is the RepRap IRC. This is a place where more than 500 RepRappers hang out to learn from each other, and it's where most of the development work takes place. RepRap has come a long way in the last few years. Where it's going, no one can tell. Thank you.